Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Genesis. Going to do chapters 38 and 39 tonight, two short chapters that read rather quickly. So where do we pick it off? Remember, where do we pick it back up? Back in Genesis chapter 37, remember Joseph, he, he's, he's Jacob's favorite son by his, by his favorite wife, Rachel. And Jacob gave Joseph the coat of many colors, meaning that he's the heir. And the, the other brothers, they didn't like that too much. And, and remember, Joseph even, um, he went back to Jacob telling Jacob some bad things that they were doing. And that they, they didn't like that too much. And then what happens, Joseph has a dream from Almighty God. And he tells them in the dream, and what the interpretation of the dream is, Joseph tells all his brothers, you guys are going to bow down to me. Has two dreams that that happened. And so that, that really sets them off. So they put this conspiracy in place. They decide that they're going to kill Joseph. But then Reuben, the firstborn, he convinces them that they shouldn't kill him at least. And then Judah comes along and he has the bright idea. Let, let's sell them to these merchant men that are coming right along. These Medianites who are, they got Ishmaelites mixed in. So they decide that they're going to sell Joseph to them. Remember, God hates that. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. They're called men stealers, people who would steal a man and put him into slavery. God hates it. But that's what they decided that they were going to do. But as we're going to learn as we go through this book of Genesis, we're going to find that it was all a divine plan. And there's going to be a great famine. And Joseph's going to be end up saving thousands and thousands of people because of where he ends up being in Egypt. But so they, they sell him to the Midianites with the Ishmaelites, and then he's going to be sold by them uh, in, into, into Egypt. And we're, that, that's basically where we pick it up. And, and remember how sad Jacob was. The, the brothers, that they took the coat of many colors, and that they killed an animal, and they just soaked the coat with animal blood. Took it back to Jacob and said, oh, is this Joseph's coat? Like, like they didn't know. So he was so sad, and he said, I'm just going to die because I'm so sad. But remember, you can get through anything, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, nothing happens to us that isn't common to everyone else, and God will always give you a way through it. And I also mentioned back in, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, when, when David's only son died, and he, he was praying that his son wouldn't die, but then when he did die, David went about his business, and, and everyone was shocked by it. But remember what David said? He said, I can't bring him back. He said, when I die, I'm going to go, I'm going to return to him. So there's no use in me just sitting around crying about it. So we should always remember that when we do have loss, because we, we will re, be returned to our loved ones when this time in the flesh is over. So Joseph just got sold into slavery. He's, he's going into Egypt. That's where we're picking it up. So let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your written word and for giving us this place we can come and teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with the Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus' precious name, amen. So we're picking it up in chapter 38, but we kind of have a little parenthetical chapter here. And uh, we're going to get back to Joseph in chapter 39, but this chapter 38... This all has to do with the seed line being protected, the seed line through which Jesus Christ would be born. As we've seen over and over in this, in this book of Genesis, going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, how Satan, every chance he got, tried to destroy that seed line, but it would never come to pass. So that's what this chapter is about, this chapter 38. So let's pick it up, Genesis chapter 38, verse 1. And it came to pass at that time that Judah went down from his brethren and turned in to a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah, saw, and Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he took her and went in under, and went in under her. Exactly the wrong thing to do. Remember, we've learned over and over in this book of Genesis, going all the way back to chapter 12, that the Canaanites had intermixed with the fallen angels. So it was absolutely forbidden to intermix with the Canaanites. They had that fallen angel blood in them. That, that corrupt, that seed line of the Canaanites was completely corrupted. And God said over and over, you stay away from them. I mean, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and in, in this book of Genesis, Abraham, through the guidance of God, told, told Jacob, told, they told Isaac, stay away from the Canaanites. Do not take them to wife. But that's exactly what Judah did right here. I mean, and remember how... How, how terrible it was that 
Esau did not care anything about his heritage. And it would seem here that Judah doesn't care anything about it either. So let's go to another verse. Verse 3. And she conceived and bare a son, and he called his name Ur. And she conceived again and bare a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bare a son, and called his name Shelah. And he was born at Chizib when she bare him. That word Chizib even means falsehood or lying. So three, three sons, but, and, and remember, it would be through Judah that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would be born. He's got three sons now. Not a single one of them fit for the Messiah to come through because that seed line is corrupted with the blood of the fallen angels. Verse 6. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord slew him. I mean, the Lord just cut him off, killed him right there. That, that word wicked in the Hebrew is ra'ah. And it means it just means absolutely lewd, morally corrupt, just um, injurious to others and, and good for nothing. I mean, that, that, that's what this guy was. And it absolutely not fit for Christ to be born through this seed line. Going in the way, and remember, the fallen angels taught, taught much perversion much corruption in many, many ways. And that, that's no doubt that's what he was partaking in. God hated it, so he just struck him dead right there. Verse 8. And remember, God sees all. He even knows all of our thoughts. Verse 8. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilled it on the ground lest that he should give his seed to his brother. He, he, didn't, want, he didn't want her to, he, he didn't want to do this because if he did this and his child was born to Tamar, it, it, the inheritance would go to this son that was born and, and it wouldn't have anything to do with him. I mean, th this child for all purposes would, would not even be his own child. It would, it would be the other ones. So he, he, didn't, he didn't want to do that and probably he didn't get along with his brother too well. Maybe another reason. But it, the son that he would have would basically not, not even be his child, so he didn't want to do this. Verse 10. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, where, wherefore he slew him also. God struck him dead. That word displeased is so much stronger in the Hebrew. It says it was evil in God's sight. I mean, you can't, you can't be doing that, what he did. So God struck him dead right there once again. Verse 11. Then said Judah to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow at thy father's house till Shelah, my son, be grown. For he said, now this next part, this is what he said to himself, is what we're about to read. For he said, he said to himself, Lest peradventure, lest perhaps he die also, as his brethren did. And Tamar went and dwelt in, his, in her father's house. So you see, Judah is telling Tamar, Look, go, go dwell at your father's house until my third son is old enough for, for you to take him as your husband. But Judah has no intention of ever doing that. that when he said that to himself, he said, well, I, I don't want to give my third son to Tamar. My first two already got killed. I'm not going to do that to my third son in, 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 in case he might get killed. So Judah has no intention of giving Sheila to be Tamar's husband. He's absolutely mistreating this widow. And you know, in Exodus chapter 22, beginning verse 22, and many other places, it says that if, if you afflict a widow or one who's fatherless, it says God's wrath is going to wax hot against you. I mean, uh, many, many times in God's word, God's saying, look, don't try to take advantage of the widows. Don't take advantage of the orphans. And God, God says, I will do right by them. And he tells us to take care of them. So that's very important. So God's wrath waxing hot against Judah, no doubt, at this very moment. Verse 12. And in process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah, and Judah was comforted and went up unto his sheep shears to Timnath, he and his friend Hira, the Adulamite. And when they go up here, there's more than just to, to shear the sheep. It's a, it's a great feast. It's a great time of rejoicing. So now Judah's wife died. It's time for him. He's thinking, I'm going to go get another wife. But one huge problem, he only wants the Canaanite women. And like I said, no doubt they're full of moral corruption, perversion. And Judah's all, he's, he's wrapped up in that now. So he doesn't want anything else. But that's a huge problem because God's plan is for Christ to be born through Judah. 
Don't worry, God's going to make a way that, that he will have a seed line that will be pure. So let's go to the next verse, verse 13. And it was told Tamar, saying, Behold, thy father-in-law goeth up to Timnath to shear his sheep. God's in control. God made sure that Tamar knew where he was going. And this is going to be a divine act to protect that seed line. Verse 14. And she put her widow's garments off from her and covered her with a veil and wrapped herself and sat in an open place, which is by the way to Timnath. For she saw that Shelah was grown and she was not given unto him to wife. I mean, it was obvious to her that Judah was lying, that she was not going to be given to her to be a husband. So what happens? Verse 15. When Judah saw her, he thought her to be an harlot, because she had covered her face. But notice, she is not an harlot at all. And that's what he thought, but she is not a harlot. Don't make that mistake. 16. And he turned unto her by the way and said, Go to, I pray thee, let me come in unto thee. For he knew not that she was his daughter-in-law. And she said, What wilt thou give me, that thou mayest come in unto me? And he said, I will send thee a kid from the flock. And she said, Will thou give me a pledge till thou send it? She's saying, I need, I need some collateral. 18. And he said, What pledge shall I give thee? And she said, Thy signet and thy bracelets and thy staff that is in thine hand. And you see, now she's going to have these things so it's proof that, her, that when she has that child, it's going to be proof that it is Judah's. This is all God's divine intervention. Uh, continue to finish in verse 18. And he gave it to her and came in unto her, and she conceived by him. 19. And she arose and went away, and laid by her, and laid by her veil from her, and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the kid by the hand of his friend the Adulamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he found her not. Then he asked the men, the, the Adulamite, he's going to try to find Tamar, or who he thinks is a harlot. So he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot that was openly by the wayside? And they said, There was no harlot in this place. 22. And he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. And also the men of the place said that there was no harlot in this place. I mean, it's a mystery. No clue where this woman's at, this harlot. But like I said, she's not a harlot. 23. And Judah said, let her take it to her, lest we be ashamed. Just let her keep the stuff I gave to her. Behold, I sent this kid, and thou hast not found her. Um, so, so he's saying, see, he understands what he did was wrong. Because like I said, she's not a harlot, but that's what he thought. I mean, he thought he was paying for her services. So he's saying, just let her keep the stuff so we don't get all wrapped up in this, and then shame come upon our family. So he knew what he was doing was wrong. He knew it was morally corrupt, but he didn't care. He was so caught up in just, in just lust. And that's a big thing in this chapter and even in the next chapter, how they just got overcome by it. And remember, Reuben got overcome by lust as well. He laid with his father's wife. I mean, God is so against that. And that will just take you down, just take you down real fast. Verse 24. And it came to pass about three months after that it was told of Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, hath played the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by whoredom. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burned. I mean, what a double standard. I mean, he, he, he was lying with harlots, lying with these Canaanite women. But the second that he finds out that, that Tamar may be pregnant by someone that's not her husband, he said, Put her to death. Burn her to death. I mean, just that's, that's so wrong. And I mentioned 2 Samuel chapter 12 earlier. I'll mention it again. Read about the first 10 verses. That goes right along with this. Because Judah condemns himself just as David condemns himself in, in that 2 Samuel chapter 12. But it, it's just crazy that, and that that's, you know, that's how a lot of guys are today. Oh, I can do whatever I want. But the second a woman does something a tiny bit wrong, I mean, just away with her, you know. Not most wouldn't say, let her be put to death. But that's what Judah's saying. It's a complete double standard, and that, that's not good. Like it says in Matthew chapter 7, it says, it says why, why do you see a little speck of dust in somebody else's eye, but you got a giant stick in your own eye, pointing out everybody else's little sins when you're the biggest sinner of them all? I mean, God hates when we do that. That's exactly what Judah was doing. Verse 25. When she was brought forth, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, by the man whose these are am I with child. 
And she said, Discern, I pray thee, whose are these? The signet and bracelets and staff. I mean, no doubt she had a big smile on her face. Oh, you want to put me to death? Well, what about these? And then so Judah knows he's caught. He realized that he's the father. Verse 26. And Judah acknowledged them and said, She hath been more righteous than I. I mean, at least he's willing to admit that. That's, that's really good. Because that I gave her not to Sheila, my son. And he knew her, and he knew her no more again. He, he didn't lie with her again after that. So that shows that he's hopefully trying to put away his lust, the flesh. I mean, tr trying to not follow lustful ways, trying to do things right. But he admitted that he was wrong. But once again, well, what is this all? What's the whole point of this whole chapter? God protected the seed line, the, and it would be through Tamar. The, uh, the child through Judah and Tamar that our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would be born. That perfect, pure Adamic seed line that was not intermixed with the fallen angels. God made sure that it was going to happen. But you see, Judah was so caught up in the Canaanite woman, women, he may have never went after anything else again. But God could not let that happen. So he made this divine intervention happen to where the seed line would remain pure and so the Messiah could be born who, who died for all of our sins and resurrected so we could have the chance at eternal life. Verse 27. And it came to pass in the time of her travail that behold, twins were in her womb. I mean, it seems a lot of times when something really big happens that, that there's twins involved. Verse 28. And it came to pass when she travailed that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took and bound up on his hand a scarlet thread, saying, This came out first. And it came to pass, as he drew back his hand, that, behold, his brother came out, and she said, How hast thou broken forth? This breach be upon thee. Therefore his name was called Perez, and that even means breach. I mean, you can't help but think of Jacob and Esau here. They're, they're fighting to be the one that, to be born first. But it would be through Perez, which our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ would be born. You can read the entire genealogy all the way from Adam to Jesus Christ in Luke chapter 3, verse 30. And afterward came out his brother that had the scarlet thread upon his hand, and his name was called Zyra. That even means the rising of the light. So that seed line was protected, and it was, it was perfect, entirely perfect, all the way down to Messiah, all the way to Mary. Through which she would be, born, Christ would be born, and she was a virgin. God placed the son in in her womb. That in the that so it is, and the seed line was protected. God is on the throne; He's always in control. No matter how off, so, so matter how far some might go away from what is right, God makes sure His plan comes to pass exactly as it's written, exactly how He planned. So we're going to go to thirty nine. Now we're back to Joseph. Chapter 39, verse 1, and it reads, And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. You understand, it didn't matter that Joseph was sold, it, sold into slavery. God was with him. Joseph served God. He did what was right. So God made sure that Joseph was prosperous. And it doesn't matter what situation you're in. No matter where you are, if you serve God and if you work hard, if you put the work in, you will be blessed by Almighty God and you will become prosperous. And don't you ever apologize for it. Job, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all super, super rich. And God never told them to apologize for it. They were rich because they were blessed by Almighty God and they worked hard for it. Verse 3. Yeah, verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. I mean, I mean it was so obvious that God was with them. This kid that just got slowed. He's, remember, he's only 17. He just got sold into slavery by his own brothers. They just stole him and sold him. But yet he's getting abundantly blessed. Just like it back in Genesis chapter 21, verse 20, where Abimelech said to Abraham, Look, it's obvious the Lord is with you. You're being so blessed, so he wanted to make a covenant with Abraham because he knew blessings were going to roll up onto him. Probably they're right next to each other, basically. So it's, it's so obvious when a true servant of God is serving God because they are blessed. Then you say, well, I'm not blessed. Well, do you ever take time to study God's word? Do you ever take time to pray to him? If you don't, then it's pretty obvious why you're not blessed. Verse 4. 
And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. I mean, Potiphar made Joseph this head over everything, basically, because he trusted Joseph, because he knew whatever he did, he was going to be blessed by it. So Potiphar is getting blessed also. Verse 5. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in the house and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. I mean, just anything Joseph touched, blessings were going to come from it. Why? Because the blessings were from God. Verse 6. And he, being Potiphar, he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not all he had, save the bread which he did eat. I mean, Potiphar just said, look, Joseph, you just take care of it all. I, I don't even need to hear about it. That's how much he trusted Joseph. That's how much he knew Joseph was going to take care of business. And more importantly, how much he knew God was going to bless him. So Potiphar didn't even trouble himself with, with the affairs. Just left it all to Joseph. Just put Joseph in charge. This one that was just sold into slavery. Finish in verse 6. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. That means that he was very good looking. And why does it say that? You're going to see what the verse is coming up. But that's the exact Hebrew phrase that's used in Genesis chapter 29 verse 17 of his mother Rachel. There in the English is translated that, that she was beautiful and well favored. It's the exact same Hebrew phrase. So like I said, let's read why that matters. Verse 7. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph. And she said, lie with me. Once again, that, that lust just becoming a big problem, even for this woman, for Potiphar's wife. And like I said, you've got to stay away from, from lust of the flesh. Verse 8. And that, that, that doesn't mean don't get married or anything like that. I would definitely doesn't say that. God, say, God says be fruitful and multiply. But if you're already married, you better not be trying to lie with somebody else. Verse 8. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wanteth not what is with me in the house, and he hath committed all that he had to my hand. Joseph, Joseph saying, I, I could never do that. Well, let's go one more verse. Verse 9. There is none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? I mean, Joseph knows he, he's saying, I could never do that. I mean, Potiphar has trusted in me. He's made me head over all this. Giving me every single thing except his wife. I'm not going to take his wife. Remember, jo Joseph, he is righteous. He, he is morally, morally and sound. So he's telling her, no, there's no way I'm going to do that. Verse 10. And it came to pass, as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her to lie with her, to lie by her, or to be with her. And J Joseph and no, make no mistake, Joseph probably would have loved to, you know, I mean, he's 17. I mean, he probably would have been real happy to, but he overcame that temptation. And that's what we all have to do. I mean, we, you have to maintain your credibility. And Overcoming some temptation is such an important thing. Like it says in Psalms chapter 119, verse 9, it says, How does a man cleanse his way? By taking heed to the word of God. By studying the word, do you, and also in other places it says, pray so that you don't fall into temptation. And another place I'll mention even is Ephesians chapter 5 verse 3. It says, let fornication not even be named once among the saints. That's amongst God's elect. Don't even let fornication be named once against you. No matter how hard it might have been, I guarantee you it wasn't easy for Joseph. But at the same time, it probably was kind of easy because he knew he couldn't commit a sin so terrible. I mean, he knew he couldn't do that. But like I said, he was only 17, and this woman that coming on to him every single day, that's not going to be super easy for anybody. But Joseph would, was never going to commit that sin. And, and like, like it says in Galatians chapter 5, 16 and 17, it says, walk in the spirit so you can overcome the lust of the flesh. It says the flesh fights against the spirit. And if you let the flesh overcome you, you can never do the things that you ought to do. So oh, you put on the spiritual man, tell your flesh to sit down and shut up, and all that you can overcome, just like Joseph did. And you know, in 1 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 2, it tells you that Joseph has the birthright. 
Because Reuben, the firstborn, he went after fornication. Judah went after fornication. And, Joda would, and Joseph would even get, he would have the birthright, even get that double portion that even two tribes would come from him, Ephraim and Manasseh. Because he did stay true to God, and he was able to overcome lust and other things. So that's so important. Remember, let fornication not be named once amongst God's elect. Let's go to the next verse, verse 11. And it came to pass about this time that Joseph went into the house to do his business, and there was none of the men of the house there within. I mean, no doubt this was by her design. Saying, I'm going to get everybody out of here, and I'm just going to trap them right here. And you see, where Joseph had to go, the storeroom, what was the back of Potiphar's house. So every day he had to walk through Potiphar's house. So that's why every single day she was right there trying to seduce him. Verse 12. And she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and got him out. I mean, you, you know what they would wear. They would wear those loose little robe things. I mean, she just grabbed it, ripped it right off of him. So he, he got out of there. He ran. Verse 13. And it came to pass when she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and was fled forth, that she called unto the men of her house and spake unto them, saying, See, he hath brought in a Hebrew unto us to mock us, speaking of Potiphar. My husband Potiphar brought this Hebrew in to mock us. He came in unto me to lie with me, and I crowded with a loud voice. I mean, she's saying he tried to force me. A one million percent lie. However, she tried to convince Joseph day after day, and he just finally, she's had enough of the rejection. Now she, now she realized she's got his clothes. So now she can make up this lie and say that he was trying to force her. I mean, that, that, that's so evil. Verse 15. And it came to pass when he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried, that he left his garment with me and fled and got him out. And she laid up his garment by her until his Lord came home. He got, got the evidence laid right out here. Look, look, Joseph, he just came in and tried to force me. But it's all a lie. But don't worry. Do you think God's going to protect Joseph? Of course he is. He didn't do anything wrong. And people will try to slander you. They'll make up lies about you. That, that's not a problem. God's with you. And as long as you know what you did was right, nothing else matters. And people who have any type of decent wisdom, any type of common sense, they'll know if the lies are made up or not. So you don't ever have to worry about someone making up a lie about you. Because it is going to happen. Verse 17. And she spake unto him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew servant which thou hast brought unto us came in unto me to mock me. And it came to pass as I lifted up my voice and cried that he left his garment with me and fled out. I mean, just an entire lie. Everything about this story is a lie. And I, I, wanna, I will say this too, that Joseph, he, he notice how he just ran as soon as that happened. Sometimes that's what you got to do. So not, not because you're afraid or anything like that. Joseph had nothing to be afraid of. But sometimes you just got to get out of there wherever you're at. If there's temptation looming, you, sometimes you just got to go. And that, that, that's wisdom. Verse 19. And it came to pass when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spake unto him, saying, After this manner did thy servant to me, that his wrath was kindled. But we're going to see in these next few verses that Potiphar, he, I think he pretty much knew that this was a complete lie. He knew Joseph would never do this. He knew how righteous Joseph was. And he knew who his wife was. Verse 20. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound. And he was there in the prison. Now, some, some might think, just reading that right off the bat, say, oh, it doesn't seem like God protected him now. He's getting thrown into prison. Well, just wait a couple of verses. But also, this was about the least of the punishment, the, the easiest punishment that Joseph could have gotten. I mean, the, for, for, the type of, for the type of accusation that was against him, it would be, the, the penalty would be at a minimum a thousand blows to that person, literally, and much worse for, for the attempt to rape somebody. I mean, probably death. And if, 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 a terrible, terrible things could have happened to Joseph if, if Potiphar would have believed his wife. But there's no doubt he, he didn't believe her. So, so he, he, got, he got put in the prison, but it's going to be right next to Potiphar's house. I mean, jo and we're about to see. Well, well, let, let's just read it and see what happens. Verse 21. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. 
Anywhere you go, God's going to be with you. No matter what situation you're in, God can touch a person's mind to put him on your side. I mean, you can't help but think of Daniel, even, even in chapter 1, how, how the, the master of the eunuchs, he came into great favor. He really loved Daniel. Was that just coincidence? No, it was because God made it that way. And you, you see many similarities between Joseph and Daniel, really. But the most important thing, the Lord was with Joseph. And he was completely protected. Verse 22. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. I mean, no matter where, where Joseph goes, he's, get, he's getting exalted to the top real quick. I mean, you know, God's word says, if you exalt yourself, you will be brought low. But if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. We see it happening here. Joseph brought into slavery, get to the top real quick. Now he's done in the prison. Already he's at the top of the prison, just overlooking everybody. Because God was with him. Verse 23, to complete the chapter. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand. Just like Potiphar, he just let Joseph take care of all of it. Because the Lord was with him, and that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. And what an awesome lesson that you know, no matter how people might try to ruin your reputation or rip you off or put you in a bad situation, if you know God's with you, you don't have anything to ever worry about. God's going to prosper you wherever you go. And don't, I have to mention also, remember Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. When you refuse to worship the false Christ, you're going to be thrown into prison for 10 days. Is that something to shake in your boots about? Of course not. We've seen over and over men of God thrown into prison, and God, God was with them. Paul, Peter, Jeremiah, Daniel, Joseph. It happens over and over and over to teach us for that 10-day period that's coming up. And it will happen because you will refuse to worship Him, and you'll be thrown into prison for a 10-day period. You can cut it easy. It's not going to be a problem. Why? Because God is with you, just like God's with Joseph. And anywhere you go, no matter what situation you're in, God's going to make you prosper if you study His Word, if you call out to Him, if you do your very best to do what's right. He's with you. But also, one more point I want to make. Notice how Potiphar and the keeper of the prison, they trusted Joseph completely because he knew that they knew that he was honest. That's how we should always strive to be. Be so honest in your, in your business and the way you do everything that people would feel comfortable just leaving everything in your hands because they know that you're not going to do anything that's wicked, that you're not going to try to rip anybody off, but you'll do everything perfectly righteous. And you will, and that is how you get so blessed. You know, people go their whole life trying to rip people off for every sin and they never end up being successful. When if they would have just done what was right and honest and done the way God's way, they would have been much, much, much more successful. So that's a lesson we can all take in our own lives. So we'll, we'll keep going on. We'll learn more about Joseph. More or less, the rest of the book of Genesis is about what's going to happen with Joseph. I mean, he, some people might have read, oh man, everything real bad's happening to Joseph. But God's with him and God takes care of him. And like I said, this is all happening so Joseph can save thousands and thousands of people because of this famine. God protected the sea line through which Christ would come. And he's protecting all these people and he's going to use Joseph to do it. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for always being in control and for taking care of us. We thank you for letting us know that no matter what may happen, we know that you're always there to protect us and to, to bless us no matter what. We thank you so much for blessing us so much, for giving us your word and for giving us this place we can teach your word. We just ask you to continue to guide us with your Holy Spirit to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, so we can share it with others. Thank you. We love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus, precious name. This is recorded November the 29th, 2020 at Smyrna Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.